Uh, good morning, delegates. Uh, the meeting will be starting shortly. We are just waiting for one of the moderator to join our session. Uh, Dr. Radhika, you can start. Yes, sir. A very good morning to one and all. On behalf of the management and the Department of Oral Pathology, Thai Mukambike Dental College and Hospital, I extend a warm welcome to all the delegates for this national webinar on HIV AIDS, which is being conducted under the aegis of the Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists, IAOMP. This event is conducted to commemorate the World AIDS Day, which was celebrated yesterday, the 1st of December. To start the program, I call upon our organizing chairman, our respected principal, the driving force behind today's event, Dr. Einstein, sir, to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Dr. Radhika. Uh, good morning, everyone. I shall begin my welcome note with the blessings of our founder chairman, our president, our secretary, and the dignitaries of our university, continuing to provide us with the ideal platform to enable and nurture talent. I welcome our stars of the day, our invited speakers, Dr. Anil Kumar and Dr. Ramya. Thank you for accepting our request and being with us today to brighten our minds. I welcome Dr. Revati Deshmukh and Dr. Himani Sukhija, our moderators, to guide us through the scientific sessions with ease. I extend a warm welcome to the President, Secretary, Executives, and Office Bearers of our Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists and to all members of our oral pathology fraternity and of our allied dental subjects. I thank, appreciate, and welcome all the delegates who have registered for this webinar today and are being with us online now. Last but not the least, <clears throat> I extend my hearty welcome to all the faculty members, postgraduates, and undergraduate students of our institution, Saimugam Bigay Dental College and Hospital. As the principal and the organizing chairman of today's webinar, it's my honor to highlight our institution before end my our institution, Dental Hospital, 
became dental school and is a constituent of Dr. M. G. R. Edwards Institute, Dindi University. We are a pioneer in the field of dental education. Started way back in 1991 with 40 students and recognized in 2001. The MDS program commenced in the year 2008 with five specialties and later three more specialties were added, including autopathology. As of today, we have 100 UG seats and 34 PG seats available for admissions, having completed successfully all the inspections from the Dental Council of India. And we are also in the process of applying for the third cycle of NAC accreditation. Our dedicated and consistent quest for excellence in teaching and training for research and patient services have helped our institution being ISO certified and getting accredited with NAC at A level. On behalf of our proud institution and the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and Oral Microbiology, headed by our esteemed colleague, Dr. Nadeem Jaddi, I welcome everyone to this wonderful session of virtual learning to observe World AIDS Day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. Yes, our strength lies in our association. I deem it my great privilege in welcoming our beloved president of IOMP, Dr. Sushmita Saxena, ma'am, to address the gathering. Dr. Sushmita, ma'am. Um, sir, Dr. Einstein, sir, kindly unmute Dr. Sushmita, ma'am. Then, Madam is the co-host now. She can uh, unmute and speak now. Yes, yes, sir. Madam, you can go ahead, madam. Uh, yes, I got it now. Uh, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be in the meeting. And uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the entire team of uh, this college, Thai Mugambigai, for taking up this uh, uh, webinar today and on such a relevant topic. And uh, I think many of us have missed this World AIDS Day yesterday, it being 1st December. Somehow, maybe because now we are so bothered about Corona and all that. Uh, and now, of course, the latest Omicron is, you know, taking up all our attention. So somehow, maybe we have missed out on this day. But I'm really happy that uh, Thai Mugambigai has taken taking up this, uh, you know, responsibility of once again making people aware of uh, HIV AIDS, uh, which has been such a huge, you know, which has made such a uh, large noise in all our lives once upon a time it was. So um, uh, thank you, the organizers, for uh, uh, you know taking up this topic and also for organizing this webinar on behalf of IOMP. And our association takes great pride in saying that uh, we have been partners for many of such academic ventures in the uh, you know past two years. And um, uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Einstein, uh, principal, as well as the organizing chairman for taking the initiative and the entire organizing team, uh, that is uh, Dr. Radhika and Dr. Uh, Anantha Lakshmi, and of course, Dr. Nadim Jeddi, he is on both sides. He's with me as one of the office bearers of IOMP and also one of the organizers of the webinar. And I also thank this, uh, the speakers, Dr. Anil Kumar and Dr. Ramya, as well as the moderators, Dr. Revdi Deshmukh and uh, 
Dr. Sukhija for, uh, you know, sparing their valuable time and participating in this webinar. And of course, nothing is success successful unless and until we have a good audience. So I can see that we have a lot many participants and you're also doing YouTube streaming. So many of them will be watching on the YouTube also, which can be watched later on also. And uh, with these words, uh, I uh, welcome all of you for this webinar today. Happy learning and all of you, please stay safe and we will be meeting again soon with some more of webinars in collaboration with our association. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you and all the best to all of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your kind words and for your valuable time. It's our pleasure to have you here, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. A boss says go. A leader says let's go. Yes. A perfect example for this is our dynamic secretary of IAOMP, who is also the joint registrar of our institution and our head of the department, Dr. Nadim Jedi, sir. Sir, I welcome you to share a few words. Uh, Dr. Nadim, sir. Thank you, Dr. Radhika, for your kind words. A very good morning to one and all present here today. It's indeed an honor to be a part of this program. Being my parent institution, it's my privilege to welcome you all to this webinar on the topic HIV AIDS Current Trends and Facts. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our esteemed speakers for today's webinar, Professor Dr. Anil Kumar and Dr. Ramya Malni. I welcome you, ma'am. Welcome you, sir. I would also like to Welcome Dr. Revati Deshmukh, the moderator and a very good friend of mine, and Himani Sukeja for their valuable time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Einstein for you know, organizing this entire event, the organizing chairman and the principal of our institute, and all my staffs who are organizing members of this uh, you know, event, organizing the committee of this event. And uh, uh, lastly, I would like to thank all the students uh, and uh, staffs, you know, all Pan-India who have uh, participated in such a huge uh, number. Uh, once again, I thank one and all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now that the felicitations are over, we shall move on to the crux of today's event, the scientific deliberations. I now call upon our scientific convener, Dr. Ananta Lakshmi, to take over. Good morning, one and all. First of all, I would like to thank for giving me this opportunity. And I extend my warm welcome to all the delegates for this virtual scientific session. And I'm very happy and it's glad to inform you that uh, numerous registrations have been recorded so far. Uh, nearly it is uh, 900 and above. So uh, to start with, uh, for the past two years, the novel coronavirus has been posing global risk with its multiple variants. Similarly, three decades before, the human immunodeficiency virus called HIV threatened and alarmed the entire world with its clinical manifestation, AIDS, explained as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. In India, the first case was diagnosed in Chennai, Dr. Suniti Solomon and her team in 1986. So since the incidence of the first case, the people of science and research have offered numerous contributions towards the diagnosis and treatment modalities of HIV and AIDS. Hence, the incidents that raised and reached its peak in 2000 gradually came down and now it is stabilized. So if we notice and analyze the research on HIV and AIDS in the past, numerous research hypotheses have been documented as facts and very few turn to be myths. So it is essential for all of us to know the current trends, facts, and concepts on HIV and AIDS. So today's scientific platform is fortunate to have two eminent speakers 
who are uh, rem have done remarkable work in their fields. Now, to start with the first lecture, I request Dr. Sai Lakshmi to introduce the moderator. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am glad to introduce the moderator of first session, Dr. Revati Deshmukh. Uh, ma'am is the professor and head, Department of Oral Pathology from Bharati Vidya Peet, from Bharati Vidya Peet Dental College and Hospital, Pune. I welcome you, ma'am, for this program. Over to you, ma'am. Can you see me? Uh, one minute. Right. Can you see me? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, good morning, all. At the outset, I would like to thank the principal of Thai Mugambi, Mugambika uh, Dental College, Bangalore, uh, sorry, Chennai, and uh, the organizing committee, Dr. Radhika, Dr. Anant Lakshmi, for inviting me. Uh, special thanks to the, our president, IOMP, Dr. Sushmita Saxena, and Dr. Nadeem Jedli, the secretary, secretary and the HOD of oral pathology in Thai Mugambika. Today, I would like to introduce you, uh, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar, uh, who is a clinical microbiologist with 15 years of experience. He did his MBBS and MD from Saurashtra University, Rajkot, Gujarat. Subsequently, he worked as a scientist at Infectious Diseases Research and Training Center, Christian Medical College, Bellor. He is one of the four Indians who are fellows of the European Confederation of Medical Mycology. His research interests include infectious diseases, antimicrobial drug resistance, micro antimicrobial stewardship, and infection control. He has 139 publications in international and national journals, which have been cited 4,800 times. He has published in reputed journals, international and national, which have been cited regularly. He has also published in journals like Lancet Infectious Diseases, Lancet Child and Adolescent Health, Clinical uh, Infectious Diseases, Emerging Inf Infectious Diseases, Clinical Microbiology and Infection, Journal of Clinical Microbiology, Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, Journal of Hospital Infection, Diagnostic Microbiology and Infectious Disease, American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, Mycosis, etc. His research interests include molecular characterization of antimicrobial resistant mechanism, clonal typing to identify outbreaks, antibiotic stewardship and infection control in hospital. His research interests also include COVID-19, MD, are TB, infectious with M. bovis BCG, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections, fungemia due to C. aureus, infections due to dimorphic fungi, non-tuberculous non mycobacterial infection, occult HPV infection, malaria, and human dirofilariasis. He has published in reputed journals, as I've already told you, Presently, he's, he is the clinical professor and head of the Department of Microbiology at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kerala, India. I welcome you, sir. Please start with the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Revedi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Revedi, for the kind introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Einstein, sir, and Professor Radhika and Professor Nadeem for inviting me for this CME. It's a privilege to be part of World AIDS Day and try to contribute to the enlightenment of AIDS. We also have a dental college in our campus, and we also are part of the teaching process of dental college as well as 
participate in research projects and uh, post graduation degrees in dental sciences so my topic today is hiv being a microbiologist i'll stick to the microbiological aspects and i've just summed it up to 10 things that healthcare workers need to know about now healthcare workers means any of us that is anybody who has got regular contact with the hospital come who is regularly going in coming out of hospital doing something there on a regular basis healthcare worker so everybody of us who are attending today should be qualified to be a healthcare worker now as the moderators have already told that hiv is a pandemic continues to be a pandemic and we have forgotten it because it has been under control for quite some time so so but we have to remember there is a lot of things that are common in hiv and covid in the present pandemic situation i can't stay away from mentioning covid in between hiv so i'll be keep on referring to covid and give examples on covid and hiv so we have learned a lot learned a lot from hiv and then we have implemented in covid with success we couldn't implement in hiv with that success but still that pandemic is under control but still still it's a problem because we don't have a potent vaccine or curative therapy for hiv as of now so everybody has seen this everyone even the children have seen this photograph we've been seeing it for the last one and a half years and will the question is which one is hiv virus you will be forgiven to if you make a mistake which is an hiv and which is a covid both of them look very similar and both of them have origins which are also zoonotic and the many things similar between both of the viruses and both of them are causing pandemic hiv pandemic we have uh, seen the pandemic we have controlled it to some extent but still it remains to be a problem so that is the pandemic we are going to discuss today so this is my first slide and i'll end up the end the presentation with the same slide to tell you which one is hiv and which one is covid so the topic is summed up in 10 uh, subheadings we'll discuss the origins everything will be tackled briefly the scope of this lecture does not permit me to go deep into all the aspects but everything so that you know everything about the virus and the disease the origin the virology transmission what is aids lab diagnosis treatment post exposure prophylaxis vaccines hiv cure and last not least hiv and sars cov 2 how they are similar what is the relation with that so this was the first report of hiv the origins in 1981 81 the disease was mentioned the disease was described in a in a cohort of healthy homosexual men they had pneumocystis carinae pneumonia it's pneumocystis gerovaceae now it's a pneumonia by a parasitic fungus which is very rare and that particular time it was very rare because you don't have immunocompromised patients that often so they discovered that these Uh, this cohort of individuals were immunosuppressed and they were having this very rare pneumonia and they had something in common so epidemiologically linked and they published in new england journal of medicine in 1981 that is 81 the disease was described and these two gentlemen luke montagnier and pasteur and suit in paris and robert gallo in us they started working on to find out the etiology of this aids the aids was discovered first and then came the hiv so hiv was successfully isolated by both these gentlemen both these gentlemen were working very hard and they uh, isolated it in 1983 84 and hiv 2 the second variant was isolated in 1986 so these are the two subtypes of hiv hiv 1 and hiv 2 though it was discovered in 81 it took at least 3 to 4 years to isolate the pathogenic agent and describe the pathogen so these two gentlemen played a big role in discovering the aids and both were strong contenders for um, nobel prize but ultimately luke montagnier and his um, colleague franco si barcenosi won the nobel prize there was a very very strong competition they fought a lot between robert gall and luke montagnier and they ultimately luke montagnier was proved to be the first one to isolate the virus describe the path etiology so he won the nobel prize in 2008 83 they discovered and 2008 only they discovered they got the nobel prize now nobel prize is not given to people who are already dead so the the thing is that you have to discover something very significant which has got significant implication to mankind and then you have to be alive to get that so that's a drawback of winning a nobel prize so you have to survive long enough to make sure that you win the nobel prize 
So in 2008 only they won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for HIV. So what are the origins? Now they did a lot of genotyping and they found that HIV one is zoonotic, two is also zoonotic, like SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 jumped from bats and we know that HIV jumped from chimpanzees and monkeys. So HIV one is simian immunodeficiency virus uh, from chimpanzee. HIV one jumped from chimpanzees, simian immunodeficiency virus in chimpanzees and HIV two simian immunodeficiency virus in Sudi Mangabe. So both origin lies in Africa. So how did the virus jump from the primates to us? So usually the hypothesis is that these Africans, the native Africans used to have bush meat. Bush meat, the way we have chicken or mutton on Sundays, they used to have these primates on Sundays or during their festival season, they used to sacrifice these primates and they used to eat it. So they had a wet market like what you had in Wuhan, where exotic species and one of them species would be this chimpanzees and Suti mangabies. So every animal has got its own immunodeficiency virus and semen immunodeficiency virus is seen in monkeys and this jump from monkeys to human being. That is a hypothesis that the virus jump from animals to human beings and then we developed HIV-1 in us. So the, during this phase of discovery, there were a lot of uh, conspiracy theories also. There was one theory suggesting that it's a genetically engineered virus by the US to eliminate all the blacks. So all these conspiracy theories were going on. Another hypothesis is that why it came in Africa. Now, African subcontinent is where the vaccines are given a lot of trials, a lot of clinical trials go in Malawi and other African countries. So at that particular time, polio vaccine was being uh, having a large trial. Polio vaccine, live oral polio vaccine was tried on large populations. And this polio vaccine virus was grown in monkey kidney cells. So monkey kidney cells, they say, was infected with semen immunodeficiency virus and the vaccine, the live vaccine that was given in adverently had the semen immunodeficiency virus that led to the jumping of the virus from animals to human. But it is a hypothesis which was not proven. So there are conspiracy theories like these, but it is not yet proven. The only proven or most likely hypothesis is that by bush market meat, consuming the meat, or they got exposure and that's how the HIV-1 and HIV-2 jumped into human beings. The SIV, semen immunodeficiency virus adapted to humans and they caused infection in humans. Though they have the same name, but HIV-2 is more similar to HIV, similar semen immunodeficiency virus rather than HIV-1. Only 40% uh, nucleotide homology is seen between HIV-2 and HIV-1. So it's more likely, more similar to the semen immunodeficiency virus from Suthi Mangabees. So this is a, a cross section of an HIV virus. It's every part of this virus is important because it's used for treatment, uh, device of treatment, and also diagnosis. So that's the reason the inventors or the people who in, uh, first identified the virus, or isolated the virus, get the Nobel Prize. Because since they um, isolated it, we are able to know what is there in this virus. So this is the spike protein. Everybody knows about spike. Spike is everywhere in Corona. You know spike protein is used for vaccine. You know spike protein is something that goes and attaches to ACE receptors. So HIV has also got as a spike protein, the has got an en uh, called as envelope protein, which has got a GP120 and GP41 fragments. These are the ones which help to attach the human cells and get infected. Then you have a uh, single standard RNA, two uh, strands of single standard positives and RNA. Then you have enzymes, integrase, protease, and reverse transcriptase. It is the most important aspect of this virus. This reverse transcriptase enzyme. That is why it is called as a retrovirus. It can convert RNA to DNA by itself. It has got everything within the virus to make a new virus. And this is the nucleocapsid, which nucleocapsid protein, which covers the genetic material, which is composed of P24 proteins. That is also a very important marker in diagnosis. So briefly speaking, it's an envelope virus with spikes all over, mushroom-like spikes all over the body, which helps in attaching and getting into it. It's an RNA virus, single standard RNA. So the same thing is COVID. COVID is also ha is an enveloped virus, has got spikes on the surface, is a single standard RNA virus. So that's where the similarity ends. So the most important genes when you describe HIV is the genes that code for the proteins, the GAC protein, P24, P7, and P17 proteins, the polymerase protein, uh, polymerase gene that encodes for protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase, they're very important three enzymes which help the virus multiply and propagate and the envelope gene which codes for gp120 and gp41 so if you want to do a post pcr you have to do a pcr for these genes to find out the virus so 
it's an rna virus and influenza virus is known to mutate very fast we know mutations we know everything about mutations everybody knows about mutations in viruses because corona is there we treated recently and became a new variant omicron which is uh, a threat now so same thing happens in hiv but in multiple times it's 65 times more mutation mutatable when compared to influenza virus so mutation is rampant in hiv that's one of the reasons of the problem that we have in hiv so what happens is the the reverse transcriptase enzyme that helps in making a new vi virus the progeny is error prone highly error prone so every time it makes a new progeny there is some error in the gene so that's the reason you have a lot of groups and lot of subtypes for hiv hiv1 is the most common one which is seen all over the world the global pandemic is due to hiv1 hiv1 has got four groups group m group that is major group nu n and group o outlier and the group p so there are four four groups and the fourth well, group m is the major one which is responsible for the pandemic all around the world and among group m there are 10 clades a b c d e f g and k and then uh, they have circulate uh, recombinant forms so the mutation is so rampant that there are so many types of hiv1 circulating around the whole world the and we will differentiate the, the, the region the clades differ according to the region of part of the world you come from so this is the amount of diversity genetic diversity that you see in hiv hiv1 is not the same virus that you see in one patient it may have some other mutation in this other one other patient so it's not similar it's not identical at all so when you see the clades the 10 clades if you go to asia it is the clade c hiv1 subtype c hiv1 subtype c is in india if somebody asks you what hiv is in india you have to just say hiv1 subtype c it's if you see in africa it's subtype c and subtype a and if you see in europe north america and south america it's only subtype b so every region in, in uh, around the world has got its own subtype so the problem being that you have so many subtypes which is uh, regionalized has got some re region specific uh, distribution then you have to have vaccines also in the same manner so most of the research is going on developed countries like america and europe and what do you expect them to do they you expect them to make a vaccine for subtype b not for subtype c which is more prevalent in africa and asia so most of the research is going on subtype b so that is the problem with having different subtypes having to develop a vaccine also that i'll come to later so i told you there is two hiv hiv1 and hiv2 they have got two different origins so what is the difference between hiv1 and hiv2 hiv1 is the most commonly seen the pandemic strain is hiv1 highly infectious highly virulent and transmits transmits very easily with during sexual transmission is very high when compared to hiv2 hiv2 doesn't spread that fast and it's not that infective or virulent and vertical transmission that is from the mother to child 20 to 25% in hiv1 if you don't give appropriate treatment imagine if the mother is undetected hiv case then she can transmit to the child 20 25% cases but hiv2 is not that transmissible from mother to child also genetic diversity because hiv1 is so rampant so widespread the genetic diversity is more and very profound in case of hiv1 but very low in case of hiv2 because we don't see it that often prevalence hiv1 is all over the globe any uh, case of hiv by default would be hiv1 unless and until proved otherwise exception is that if you go to west africa you may find a case of hiv2 more common origins i have already told you hiv1 came from chimpanzees and hiv2 came from sooty man babies and aids well, development of aids hiv and aids are two different terms the aids is the ultimate uh, disease state of hiv where the patient becomes really sick so development of aids is between 7 to 8 years if you don't treat the patient don't treat the patient at all 8 to 10 years he becomes aids patient hiv2 it takes 20 years so there is a condition called as long term non progressive state hiv2 patients only 20 to 25% end up with aids that also more than 20 years later and most of them can control the viral load control the cd4 level and remain healthy their life long without having much problem that is a case in case of hiv2 but you have also to remember that all the research all the drugs all the vaccines everything is being done for hiv1 very little is being done for hiv2 so uh, some brief things about the virus the virus is called as a lenty virus slow virus that is the reason in spite of having a hiv pandemic we are not much worried about it because it's a slow virus 
the death comes slowly by the time it's it's almost 10 years 8 to 10 years down the line that the untreated case of hiv would die so that's the reason we are not panicked when people or die in a short interval of time like covid then the mortality seems to be very high but if you look at the tb mortality tb mortality is far greater than covid but we don't give it much importance because the people die gradually they don't die all of a sudden so it's a lenty virus a slow virus it's an rna virus double two uh, strands of rna positive sense rna is there and it has got multiple enzymes in it uh, to make the new progeny that is integrase protease and reverse transcriptase the most important part of this virus is that the virus will integrate into the host genome and forms a pro virus now this pro virus which is part of the host nuclei host genome will remain dormant and will cause infection later on so any drug that you give for hiv will not target the pro virus that is part of the host genome so you can't cure hiv the pro virus is the reason why you are not able to cure hiv and the hiv is constant it remains in the system you can't eradicate the virus from the patient's body in spite of having very potent antivirals so pro virus is the reason and pro virus is part of the human genome part of the human genome so this is in brief how the infection from hiv occurs the moment a patient is gets exposed to hiv virus the hiv has got its gp120 and 41 the spike proteins and go and bind to the cd4 cells so it preferentially attacks the cd4 cells cd4 positive t cells that is the helper t cells in case of covid it preferentially binds at the ace receptors ace receptors are present in the respiratory epithelium so it binds at the ace receptors and then goes into it similar but a different antigen or different receptor is used so the moment it binds to the cd4 antigen it integrates the gp41 helps in binding the fusing the virus to the cell membrane and then it releases the genetic material that is a single stranded rna the single stranded rna is converted to a single stranded dna by the reverse transcriptase enzyme that the virus itself has this single stranded dna is then converted to a double stranded dna by the same reverse transcriptase enzyme so the reverse transcriptase enzyme is a very very important part of the virus it helps in converting the rna to dna so now you have a double stranded dna here this double stranded dna in the cytoplasm of the cell will go into the nucleus and then this integrase enzyme will integrate the viral genome viral dna into the host genome so it is pushed into inserted into the host genome the genome of the cd4 cell cd4 nucleus the nucleus contains the genome the pro virus is formed now this is the most dangerous part of the virus this is the reason no antiviral can reach it kill it it remains dormant and once activated it will produce mrna these mrnas are then goes into the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum and their mrnas are translated to proteins viral proteins in the ribosomes from here they are translated into proteins the viral different components of the virus and they are assembled together and new virus comes out of the cell the coming out of the cell is caused budding it's it buds out of the cell the moment it buds new viral particles buds out of the cell it punches hole in the cell it's not that one virus alone comes multiple viruses start budding one virus enters and hundreds of viruses will come out budding from this cell so this budding will punch multiple holes into the cell so what will happen the cell will die that is the pathogenesis virus infects multiplies in it buds out lyses the cell the cd4 cell is destroyed that is the pathogenesis of hiv and some in some cases the pro virus will remain dormant and will not produce mrnas so this dormant cell can act, can get activated at any point of the patient's lifetime and produce new viral particles so that is the dangerous part of the virus that is why it is a long standing infection that is the that is why we can't eradicate the virus so the basic pathology as i have told you cd4 positive cells are infected and they are destroyed chronic activation of cd4 cells will cause multiple viral particles to bud out lice and death or they can stimulate uninfected cd4 positive cells and they will undergo apoptosis death or the infected cd4 positive cells will be killed by the hiv specific cytotoxic lymphocytes that is cd8 lymphocytes that is a normal immune system response from the body that will kill cd4 cells so to sum it up everything will destroy the cd4 cell the pathogenesis is that cd4 positive cells will die either directly or indirectly by the immune mechanism and they get depleted So this is how the depletion occurs. The infected cells are targeted by the CD4. They go and try to kill it. They in turn get infected, and ultimately the 
virus survives, multiplies, buds out and destroys. And the rate at which the CD4 positive cells are produced and the rate at which the CD4 positive cells are depleted is almost the same in between. And later on in the HIV state, that is during six or seven years down the line, depletion is far greater than the uh, rate at which the new CD4 cells are produced. And the patient is exhausted, depleted of all CD4 cells and develops AIDS. So that is the pathogenesis. So eventually the patient will develop AIDS because of severe depletion of CD4 cells and it cannot be replaced by the normal immune mechanism. So let's come to the definition of AIDS. AIDS means a patient who is HIV positive and who has a very low CD4 level. A CD4 cutoff is given as less than 200. If, you, if the patient is, who is HIV positive has a CD4 level of less than 200, he is classified as a case of AIDS. AIDS is a disease state or he has got an AIDS defining illness. I'll come to it later on. So if he has an AIDS defiling illness like cryptococcal meningitis or he has got a CD4 cell less than 200, he is considered a case of AIDS. To sum it up, all HIV positive patients don't have AIDS, but all AIDS patients will have HIV. AIDS is a terminal illness which is seen in HIV disease. HIV is a virus. AIDS is a disease. The HIV positive patients, if they take ART, that is treatment, they will not end up with AIDS. But you don't take ART, he will end up with AIDS. That is severe depletion of CD4 cells, getting opportunistic infections. So that is the difference between AIDS and HIV. So let's see briefly the natural history of the infection. So this, at this point, we assume that the primary infection has occurred. This is the point at which infection occurs in a healthy individual. So the moment the, moment the virus enters, this, this is the dotted line is a CD4 level. The CD4 cells get infected, they get destroyed. So there is a dip in the CD4 levels and there is a rise in the viral load. Initially, within three to six weeks, the, the viral load increases, peaks, and the CD4 goes down. Now the body fights back. The body is immunocompetent. It's just a naive infection, first infection. So the body will fight back. During the fight back, the CD4 cells will now start killing the infected CD4 cells, the new CD4 cells come, cytotoxic T cells also comes, in, comes into action. So infected cells are removed and the CD4 recovers and the viral load goes down. The moment the body starts to fight back, the viral load comes down. So this is the acute phase, primary infection. And this is the latent phase when the body is fighting continuously with the virus and the body has got the upper hand. The CD4 cells have got upper hand. They are above 400 or 600 level, continue to be that way. And gradually, by seven to eight years, the viral load increases. The virus has got an upper hand. The body is no longer able to control the viral infection. And the CD4 depletes severely. And the viral load increases exponentially. And by nine to 10 years, this is the eighth state where the patient will develop opportunistic disease and deaths. This is the eighth condition where. So this, is, this happens only if you don't treat the patient. If you don't treat the patient, this occurs within 10 years, the patient is dead. So untreated HIV is a death sentence, but a treated HIV is a life sentence. Life sentence is the sense the patient has to take treatment all his life. So this is the natural history of the viral infection where the virus and the CD4 cell compete with each other for about six to eight years. And at the end, the virus has got an upper hand, the patient develops opportunistic infection and he dies. So there are certain individuals who do well with HIV for some, some unknown reason, they, this, they tend to have a good CD4 count and low viral load. They're able to control the infections because their immune system is able to tackle the virus. So they are called as long-term non-progressors. They are not progressing to AIDS. So they maintain a good CD4 level. They are infected, they have infection, they can transmit infections, but they don't develop AIDS. So these are long-term non-progressors. Very rarely we see, but there are people who tend to do well without treatment. Without treatment, a normal individual will go and die by 10 years due to AIDS. So this is without treatment. If you give treatment to this individual, this individual also will achieve a long-term non-progressive state, but with the help of anti antivirus. So to sum it, sum it up, after infection, there is a period of zero conversion. That is, antibodies are developed in the patient's body. So it will take at least three weeks for some significant amount of antibody to develop in the patient's body. So initially, we have a flu-like illness. Then we have an asymptomatic phase where the patient doesn't have any symptoms. Then we have a symptomatic phase, and then we have an AIDS. AIDS, you have, AIDS is characterized by the opportunistic infection, so AIDS-defining illness. 
So it is divided into category A, category B, and category C. Category A is infection, primary infection. Primary infection is just like any flu or a corona also, fever, lymphadenopathy, body ache. So only seen symptoms. So people will never realize from the symptoms that the patient is having AIDS. So it's just a flu-like symptom, self-limiting symptom. Some lymph node enlargement will be said that lymph node enlargement is usually seen in most of the respiratory viral infections, even. EBV causes lymph node enlargement. So you are never able to dif differentiate unless and until you actively pursue HIV or the patient knows that he has got an exposure to HIV, then only he'll be able to find out, detect HIV at this particular stage. Otherwise, this particular stage is just like any other flu. And lymph node enlargement would be seen. That may also subside later on. Category B is your symptoms. Some uh, infections occur which are usually seen in most of the individuals like diabetic individuals or patients on cancer chemotherapy or patients having some other immunodeficiency state like oropharyngeal candidiasis, very common in diabetics or people who people who don't have oral hygiene, proper oral hygiene. So that doesn't mean that he's got a child. Vulvar vaginal candidiasis, that's also seen very commonly in females, vaginal candidiasis. But persistent and resistant, you have to think about it twice. Pelvic inflammatory diseases, zoster infection. Herpes zoster classically occurs when you have a immunodeficiency state. But that can also occur when you have fever. Just having fever also can uh, precipitate herpes zoster. So that also is not a very clearly defining condition, but repeated herpes zoster infection, you should think twice, there should be something wrong with it. Then fever for continuously or pyrexia of unknown origin for more than one month, diarrhea for more than one month without any reason. So these are symptoms that you are red flags or category B, but they are not uh, characteristics of HIV. Now, category C is AIDS defining illness. If any of these infections you see in the patient, think about AIDS, rule out AIDS. So, candidiasis of whether that goes beyond the oral cavity, that is the trachea, bronchi, or lung, esophageal candidiasis, cryptococcal meningitis. It's by default you have to rule out HIV when you see cryptococcus, cryptosporial diarrhea, it's very common in immunocompromised patients, especially HIV, CMV disease, which is seen in immunosuppressed patients non tuberculous mycobacteria, mycobacterium tuberculosis, both pulmonary and extra pulmonary. So the, you have to consider a risk factor for HIV for every case that is diagnosed for mycobacterium tuberculosis. You have to rule it out because you don't want to miss the HIV. Because treating tuberculosis in an HIV patient will worsen the condition. So you have to know the HIV status of the patient. Then pneumosis to gerovesi, which was the initial, the first report where they found pneumosis to gerovesi very commonly seen in immunocompromised patients. So these are AIDS-defining illnesses. If you see this, any of them in your patient, think about HIV, rule out HIV. So according to these, they have also categorized, CDC has categorized based on the CD4 cells also. The CDC says that category A, category B, and category C. That is, C is AIDS-indicated conditions. Category B is symptomatic, but not AIDS-indicated condition. And category A is asymptomatic or acute HIV. So if your CD4 cell is more than 500, it is uh, categorized as A1, B1, or C1. If the CD4 is 200 to 49, it is A2, B2, and C2. If CD4 is less than 200, it is categorized A3, B3, and C3. Any CD4 less than 200, the patient fits into the criteria of having AIDS. Now, we finish finished the pathogenesis. We come to the lab diagnosis. Lab diagnosis is very robust. Everybody knows how to diagnose HIV. There are very robust assays now. So we don't have any doubt or any uh, any confusion in how to go about diagnosing HIV because very robust ELISA assays are there. But to be sure, we have a screening assay which is very, very sensitive and we confirm the assay with a very specific test so that we rule out all false positive. As I said, diagnosis of HIV is previously would have been a death sentence to the patient. In today's world, diagnosing HIV, a patient who is affordable, who can take antiretroviral therapy is a life sentence. That is, you are telling him that you have to take antiretroviral therapy, which are toxic and multiple antivirals for his whole rest of his life. So that is the implication of giving an HIV positive. So you have to be doubly sure when you brand a patient is HIV positive. So let's see the dynamics of HIV for diagnosis. The first three weeks of after exposure, it is very difficult to identify. So it's only expensive tests like HIV viral load or P24 assay will pick up uh, infection in the first three weeks so because they are not seen in the system. After three weeks, the antibodies come into the circulation. So that is called as a window period. So in the window period, don't try to diagnose the patient. 
wait for three to four weeks, then go for diagnosis because that will be more appropriate because you may get a false negative. So as you cross the barrier of third week, the antibodies are plenty. The pink line is the antibody. You have plenty of antibodies in the circulation. You can easily diagnose it. But the P24 antigen can be picked up in the window period, peaks up, and after 50 days, it goes down because antibodies will neutralize it. So P24 antigen is not a very good assay when you are looking at beyond four weeks of infection. Beyond four weeks of infection, only go for antibodies. HIV viral load, however, can be done any time of the disease. It will come positive. It will tell, it will tell the number of viruses in the viral load in the patient system. So what are the technologies that we have? Antibodies. Everything is antibodies. If you want to diagnose HIV, it's only antibodies. The most robust and easiest, the cheapest and easily available method is antibodies. And we have different assays now. The science has come to such an extent that these ELISA assays are very, very sensitive and very, very specific also. Previously, we used to have uh, poor specificity, but now these ELISA assays are very specific also. So one test is also good enough to diagnose if you say if you have very high titers of antibody. So we have enzyme link, uh, chemiluminescence assay, fluorescence assays, which are very rapid and they are fourth generation ELISA. Now, when you order an ELISA, you have to understand that there are third generation ELISA and fourth generation ELISA. Most of the institutes must be using a third generation ELISA, but many are using fourth generation also. Fourth generation is a bit expensive. The difference being that the fourth generation will pick up an antigen also, antigen and antibody, P24 antigen and antibody. But the third generation will pick up only your antibodies, not the antigen. So the window period infection will not be picked up by a third generation ELISA, but a window period infection can be picked up by your fourth generation ELISA. We in our hospital use only a fourth generation ELISA for screening. Most of you must also be using it, but try to make sure that your lab is using a fourth generation ELISA for screening HIA patient. Then once you get a screening test positive, you have to confirm with a second test. It could be a Western blot. It could be another ELISA, another fourth generation ELISA from a different company. That is also good enough. Two tests is required because giving a positive test means a life sentence or a death sentence to the patient. Then you have confirmatory tests like HIV, RNA, P24 assays, mostly done when you have a suspicion within the first three weeks. If you have a suspicion in the first three weeks of infection, go ahead with this. If you are ready to wait after fourth week or fifth week, do an antibody assay, fourth generation ELISA, that's great. This is a Western blood assay. Previously, we used to do a lot of Western blood assay for confirmation, but as the science has progressed, the diagnostics have progressed, we have very good specific assays in the ELISA itself. So doing two ELISA is good enough. In Western blood, we look for at least 10 antibodies for HIV, and any two antibodies comes positive. Any of the two GP160, 120, or 41 antibodies is positive, or any P24 antibody is positive, is considered to be positive. You don't require all the 10 antibodies to be positive. It's an expensive, labor intensive test, rarely done nowadays. We have it in our uh, lab, but very rarely people order nowadays for Western blood. But Western blood is meant only for confirmation. Don't order a Western blouse unless and until your ELISA is positive. You have to have an ELISA positive to run a Western blot. The Western blot is not meant for screening. So how do you test a patient? Depends on when the patient comes. Now, in your setup, in my setup, people come with needle stick injuries or exposure, sudden exposure or mucous membrane, blood exposure, sharp injury, then they come there. So that is a situation where we like to do a testing. So if it is 12 days after the needle stick injury, after the exposure, go for an RNA, HIV RNA, not before 12 days. Give at least 12 days to do an RNA test. That is a viral load assay. It's expensive, may not be available everywhere. Now, if you are having, uh, if you have 15 days on the 15th day or 16th day, you can do a P24 assay. P24 assay in isolation is very rarely available, but you can use a fourth generation ELISA, I've told you. Fourth generation ELISA picks up antigen and antibody. If you have a fourth generation ELISA, this is the time you do a fourth generation ELISA. After 15 or 16 days, you do a fourth generation ELISA, you will pick up an HIV. In, uh, by 28th day, IgM antibodies will be there. And by 30th day, all the antibodies will be there. So if you, ideal time is 30 days. At 30th day, do a fourth generation ELISA, you will pick up HIV anyway. Because it's a, the disease is long standing, going to last a lifetime for the patient. So why not wait for 30 days and do that? But if you are not, Rest with time, go for an HIV RNA or a P24 assay. That is the way you apply a test depending on the number of days from the exposure. So there are strategies. HIV testing is very, very regulated because HIV has got a lot of social implications. 
So you just can't test a patient just because you feel like testing or you think that it is having HIV. You have to take an informed consent from the patient. You have to inform the patient that you are going to test for HIV. That is what I suspect. And there is a pre-test counseling. A counselor should be appointed. There should be a pre-test counseling set up separately who counsels the patient, the implications of HIV testing, implications of false positive, implications of positive, what are the consequences, everything. And what precautions you should take meanwhile before the test results come. So these things need to be done. And once the test results come, it is very, very confidential. Only the patient can be conveyed the report. You can't convey it to his relatives or anyone. The doctor, treating doctor or ordering doctor should convey it personally. We send the report in a sealed envelope to the consultant. He discloses the HIV status to the patient. And before that, he has to go a post-test counseling. People may do something odd. Some people have committed suicide after knowing that they are HIV positive. So we have to tell them the implications of having an HIV positive report that it needs confirmation, a confirmatory test needs to be done. And even if that comes positive, HIV is not deadly, you can happily live for 10 to 20 years with suppressing the antivirus using good antiviral treatments. There's no need to worry about that. So the post-test counseling is also required. So there are different strategies. If you're looking for a blood bank, only one test is required because we, are, we will not give that blood if it comes positive. But the blood bank's responsibility is there to inform the patient and confirm the status in that particular patient. If you're looking at surveillance cases, you will do two tests. But well, that is one test one and test two, both have them, both of them have to come positive in case of strategy two. And strategy three is for diagnosis. That is giving a life sentence or death sentence to the patient. You have to do three tests. Three tests is mandatory in case of strategy three, or at least two tests should come positive. Any two tests should come positive. With good specificity and sensitivity. If two tests comes positive, you can brand the patient as an HIV positive patient. So where do you use the strategy? Strategy one, as I already told you, blood banks. To screen the donor, if he comes positive, we discard the blood. Blood bank should inform the patient and send him for counseling and get uh, proper diagnosis done. So strategy two is for surveillance. Surveillance, you have to rule out false positives because you are coming to a conclusion that this is the prevalence of HIV in this community. So you have to do two tests. Two tests have to come positive. Strategy three is that you do three tests and any of the two tests should come positive, but it requires, it is for diagnosis, it requires counseling, pre-test counseling, post-test counseling, report is confidential, should be conveyed by the physician himself. So these are the strategies and where we use strategies. So just don't order HIV to any patient. If he comes positive, you will have a very bad time explaining him why you ordered the test and what is the implication. So once the patient is diagnosed with HIV, you have to follow him up for treatment and prognosis and outcomes. So you do a viral load and CD4 level. There are two very expensive tests. CD4 level and viral load may not be available everywhere. It is, uh, it is expensive, comes at a cost, so you have to use it judiciously. The moment the patient is diagnosed with HIV, Order a viral load, order a CD4 test, if available, or either if either of is available, order one of them. So the frequency of repeating is every three to six months for viral load. A viral load, the uh, lower detection of limit for any system is 50 copies per ml. Anything less than 50 copies per ml, it will be undetectable. It is supposed to be very, very good. If viral load comes negative, the patient cannot transmit HIV. So at the target of treatment is to bring the viral load to undetectable levels. That is a target of antiretroviral treatment. The viral load needs to be done for detecting resistance. But the viral load doesn't tell you the disability of the patient. How bad? What is the prognosis? Prognostic indicator is not viral load. The high viral load does not tell you how fast he will progress to AIDS. The viral load needs to be done only to uh, follow up the treatment to detect resistance and to make him non infectious. A viral load of less than 50 is considered to be non infectious. He cannot transmit the virus through sexual contact. CD4, however, is very, very important. If given an option, do always a CD4 test. CD4 every three to six months. Once a patient's CD4 levels are more than 200 or more than 500, you can do once in 12 months or six months. So, I'd, our idea is to have a CD4 level of more than 200. Anything less than 200 is AIDS. That is how we classify the patient. And it is very, very prognostic. The amount of CD4 level will tell you how fast the patient will progress to HIV AIDS if not treated. It helps in indicating the disease state, the disability. In fact, in US, 
If the CD4 level is less than 50, they get a disability benefit where the government will support him with antiretroviral therapy so that he can come up um, above 50. The moment he comes above 50, he loses the disability benefits. So that is the importance of CD4 level. So if you give it an option, what you want to do, if the patient can afford only one thing, go for CD4 level. That gives you a prognostic indicator how fast he, he will progress to AIDS, how, how well he is doing on antiretroviral therapy. So this is this is a graph which tells you the blue uh, bars are CD4 level of more than 350. So if you have more than 350 and the viral load is somewhere around 3,000 to 10,000, the probability of going to AIDS in three years time is only 6.8. But you have a low CD4 level of less than 200, the probability of going to AIDS is 14%. That is, if you have a good CD4 level of more than 350, the probability of going to AIDS is 14.8 if you have a viral load of 10,000 to 30,000. And when you have a low CD4 level of less than 200, the probability of going to AIDS is 50%. And it increases exponentially if you have viral load of three, more than 30,000, it's 85%. But you have a good CD4 level, the probability is only 39%. So CD4 level decides how fast you will pro a patient will progress to AIDS. So main idea of treatment is to have a good, robust CD4 level. And once you have a good CD4 level, the viral load also will come down. But not necessarily because there are people who have got good CD4 level and viral load of more than 30,000. So our, our objective would be to achieve a good CD4 count first. As I told you, a viral load of less than 50 is undetectable. If a patient's viral load on treatment is undetectable, he cannot transmit the virus through sexual transmission. So he can live a normal life. He can live a normal individual's life without fearing any transmission. Unless and until a blood body fluid exposure occurs. That is unlikely to occur. He has to take care that he doesn't uh, get cuts and doesn't bleed. So sexual transmission, which is the most common method of transmission in HIV, will not occur if the viral load is less than 50. So that is the importance of knowing the viral load, for tracking the viral load. So let's discuss briefly on antiretroviral therapy. There are very, very good antiretroviral drugs. We have come a long way since we discovered lamodine and zidovudine. The basic idea of giving an antiretroviral therapy is that the patient will die. It's a death sentence if you don't give antiretroviral therapy. The antiretroviral therapy will only reduce your viral load, reducing the viral load, reducing the infection, increasing the CD4 count. It will prevent complications. That is, the patient's progression to AIDS will be delayed indefinitely. It can be delayed indefinitely if you have a robust antiviral treatment for a long duration. And each, there are multiple, it's multi-drug treatment like TB. You hit the virus in many places so that it doesn't become resistant. Because I, in the beginning, I told you it's a very, very error-prone virus. It keeps on mutating. So you don't want it to become resistant to the antivirus. There are different classes of antivirals, four different classes, main different classes, and usually three or two or three drugs are given together to prevent development of resistance. So antiretroviral therapy, though very, very potent, will not cure HIV. The reason being, we have a provirus which is sitting inside the host genome, which cannot be targeted by any antiretroviral therapy. It won't go into the nucleus and kill the provirus. The provirus is something that will get activated later and produce more viruses. So you can reduce the viral load, that is a virus outside the cell, virus inside the cell cannot be tackled. So that is the reason we are not getting a cure for HIV. So this is the different places where the antiretroviral therapy will act. As I've told you, the uh, life cycle of the virus, the antiretroviral therapy can prevent fusion of the virus into the cell, that is fusion inhibitors. It will inhibit the reverse transcriptase enzyme, that is non-nucleotide and nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are the two classes of uh, drugs. Then we uh, antiretroviral therapy, which blocks the protease, is called as protease inhibitors. Blocks the integrase is called as integrase inhibitors. So these are the different classes depending on the site of action, where it acts, whether it acts in protease, integrase, and uh, RT, uh, reverse transcriptase, or fusion. So this is a whole plethora of antiretroviral therapy that is available now. We have a very good pipeline of antiretroviral therapy, very robust therapy, which is coming, developing as we talk. So initially we had nucleus, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The most common was with lamovidine, lamo zidovudine, tenofovir and abacavir is still used. It's the latest one which are being used nowadays. 
non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors that are also used but not as frequently as nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors like efavirenz and nevirapine then you have integrase inhibitors very very commonly used nowadays the present regime contains integrase inhibitors like ratigravir and daltogravir then we have protease inhibitors protease inhibitors are uh, rit ritonavir lopinavir nefilavir these are all protease inhibitors that are also combined with the treatment entry inhibitors are very very rarely used very very expensive you have to do certain pre test before using entry inhibitors not commonly used like efavirenz and furutide so this these are the classes of antivirals now these are the combinations previously we used to ha have to take one one from each class or two from uh, different classes two or three so multiple tablets so now they have come the fixed dose combinations where we have all the three or four antivirals together so it becomes very easy for the patient to be compliant and reduces toxicity also so they can take one or two pill daily to control hiv in a very good manner so this is the category i've just touched it briefly because it's beyond the scope of our lecture but this is the options available for treatment just one example treatment of nave a recently diagnosed hiv you would give tenofovir emcitrabine that is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor with a daltogravir or ratigravir that is a uh, integrase inhibitor these are the three drugs that you can give apcavir lamivudine lamivudine plus daltogravir can be given as an alternative so this is the combination that is most commonly used for nave uh, patients it comes at a cost these uh, antivirals are costly but they are also provided free of cost by the government after coming to, treat, to treatment now we look into transmission how it is transmitted the uh, all the audience the members of the audience must be knowing how it's transmitted but still i'll just brush on the salient aspects blood transmission infected blood 98% chances that it will cause perinatal that is mother to the child mother to the child during delivery occurs 20 to 30% if no intervention takes place if you don't realize that the mother is positive if you realize the mother is positive and she is an antiretroviral you do a cesarean section you don't breastfeed the child you clamp the cord immediately less than 2% chance the mother will transmit the virus to the child sexual intercourse is the most common method but numbers are very small 0.1 to 1% but don't go by the numbers because sexual intercourse is very common so that is the unprotected sexual intercourse that is most commonly causing the infection transmission of the infection then we have ivd in, uh, injectable drug users where the transmission is 0.67 by sharing infected needles a needle stick injury that is something in your occupation in my occupation sharp injury from a patient who is bleeding you are working on the oral cavity you get a sharp injury so the oral cavity is full of blood because you are uh, extracting a tooth or you are doing procedure or a mucous membrane splash the uh, spray or the wash or the suction water comes and splashes on your eye so the transmission is very very low 0.09 in case of mucous membrane needle stick injury is 0.3% now in layman terms it means that if you get a needle stick injury it can transmit one in 300 needle stick injuries 0.3 means one in 300 needle stick injury and also that it should be a high risk injury that it should be a hollow bore needle wide bore needle visible fresh blood should be then it should be deep and the patient also should be having a really age defining illness only then the transmission is very robust so if all these criteria is fit then only the transmission will occur otherwise very unlikely a needle stick injury would transmit one in 300 the other cutaneous and mucous membrane the transmission is only in one in 1000 exposures so very very low but still the transmission risk is there so if you have a mucous membrane cutaneous or percutaneous exposure transmission risk is always there if it gets transmitted it's a life sentence or death sentence so we have to prevent this particular transmission so for that we have post exposure prophylaxis very important in your setup in my setup we are prone to get exposed inadvertently to an hiv positive patient by mucous membrane or by needle stick injury sharp injury or cutaneous injury so depend you have to grade the infection control will grade the risk of injury how bad the injury is whether it's a wide bore needle fresh blood is involved whether the patient is having aids and everything and then you have to report immediately to the infection control what is the time period you have to report immediately the moment the patient reports to the infection control department he has to be immediately given the first dose of antiretrovirus there is no time limit as soon as possible as soon as possible the patient should be put on an antiretroviral therapy immediately and then you investigate what happened if you know that the exposure is from hiv positive patient only then 
If you don't know what exposure occurred, then we have to test the patient to know the HIV positive status. That will take at least six to 12 hours. In our place, it will take at least three hours for testing HIV, for collecting the sample, reaching the lab testing. Testing will take only one hour. So in three hours, we will give you a report, but we have to wait for three hours. But if there is a high risk, give the treatment immediately, put the uh, antiretrovirus, give the patient, take, uh, allow him to take the first dose and then start investigating if it's a known case. Therapy is usually given because we have the risk of resistant viruses being transmitted by an HIV positive patient. So ideally, we nowadays give triple therapy for all cases of post-exposure prophylaxis. The post-exposure prophylaxis timing is critical as soon as possible. Beyond 72 hours, no role of post-exposure prophylaxis. So start post-exposure prophylaxis with antiretrovirals as soon as possible if it's a known HIV positive case exposure. Then there is this natural resistance to HIV. Some people are inherently resistant to HIV. Very good to have uh, resistant people who don't get such infections. The resistance is due to a mutation. Now, the virus binds to the CD4 cell. This is the CD4 uh, uh, antigen, the virus spike proteins, the GP120 goes and binds to it. For an ideal binding to occur, this CCXR5 co-receptor should also bind to it. Only then the internalization of the virus takes place, the infection is successful. So certain people have this mutation for this CCR5. CCR5 co-receptor, there is a mutation, CCR5 co-receptor. This is the ideal way the infection occurs. If there is a mutation that is delta 32 mutation in that region, the CCR5 is not available, it's not on the surface. It is not available for attachment. Virus doesn't infect. These people are immune, totally immune to HIV. They won't get HIV. So that is a very exceptional case where people, in some groups of people in Africa are naturally immune to HIV. That's how they found out that there is a mutation of CCR5 which prevents HIV infection in these individuals. So they don't get HIV even if they are exposed to HIV. So what did they do? Cure for HIV. Now, you may wonder there is a cure for HIV. Everybody would say there is no cure for HIV, but there are exceptional cases where cure for HIV has actually been achieved, but it's a very expensive and very head, a tedious process. Now, the first person to be cured for HIV is Timothy Ray Brown, from a US citizen in Seattle, Washington. He was diagnosed in HIV in 1995, began antiretroviral therapy diligently, and in 2006, he found that he was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. So he has HIV and he has a blood cancer, acute myeloid leukemia. Now, what happened that he went to Germany. Germany, he went for bone marrow transplantation for acute myeloid leukemia. He has HIV in the first place, and then acute myeloid leukemia. Then the doctors thought that why not transplant this patient with a bone marrow, a match with a bone marrow, which has a Delta 32 mutation. A Delta 32 mutation, I've already told you, leads to a defective CCR5 receptor. So they tried this, and what happened is, this is the guy with HIV and a normal CCR5, no mutation. They under, he undergoes chemo and radiation to kill all his bone marrow cells, and then he undergoes a transplantation. This is an individual who undergoes transplantation with a Delta 32 mutant bone marrow. The bone marrow was received, or stem cells were received from a patient with a Delta 32 mutation. He was a perfect match. They gave him the bone marrow, transfused him, and now this individual has got a CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. So Timothy Ray Brown developed blood cells with CCR5, Delta 32 mutation. So his AML was cured because he got a new bone marrow, which was not infected. His HIV was cured because his CD4 cells didn't have the CCR5 uh, co-receptor. It was a mutant thing, no HIV. But this patient actually survived cancer and HIV, but he had to undergo twice. The stem cell transplant had to, undergo, to be done twice. It's a very rare exception where you can get this signal. That is called a London patient also now. There is an individual in London in, with HIV who has been cured in a similar fashion by getting a bone marrow transplantation with a CCR5 mutation, Delta 32 mutation. But this is his viral load. After stem cell transplant, the viral load just went down, disappeared. This is a CD4 count. It gradually increased and reached a peak. Now, he's cured for HIV. He's cured for acute myeloid leukemia by bone marrow transplantation. But it's not advisable to a bone marrow transplantation in case of an HIV, you have to have better reason because if you take drugs properly, you live a longer life. In fact, in developed world, 
they are more hiv patients are more worried about dying by stroke heart attack or lifestyle diseases diabetes so they are less worried about hiv because they can control the viral load to that extent they undergo heart transplant liver transplant lung transplant all sorts of transplant a normal person would undergo and they survive those transplants efficiently because the viral load has been brought under control efficiently by the drugs potent antiviral drugs so now about on vaccine why we are not able to make vaccine for hiv because as i told you high level of mutation it keeps on mutating subtype c b a there are 10 clades you need to have a vaccine for each subtype for each region and broadly cross neutralizing antibodies that is a single vaccine producing antibodies covering all clades 10 clades is not possible the virus transmit to mucosal transmission through the mucosal tract or the sexual transmission so that for that you have to have good amount of antibodies in the mucosal immunity so that is also very difficult to achieve a very good animal model is not there because what we do animal testing is in chimpanzees and primates they don't get infected with our hiv they get infected only with the simian immunodeficiency virus so we don't have a very good model animal model for testing vaccines we test vaccines with simian viruses and then make human hiv viruses vaccines and then give to human there is a big gap in animal testing we don't have a very good model which is susceptible to hiv and the surface glycoproteins are covered by a, a sugar layer sugar layer which is not allowed to interact with the antibody so antibodies though present will not neutralize the virus but these are the challenges that we face in the hiv vaccine that is the reason we are not able to get a robust hiv vaccine till now so these are the seven trials there were seven hiv vaccine trials six of them failed only one showed some efficacy that is only 31% efficacy that's very poor and in fact there were two vaccine trials where it has to be terminated prematurely because the vaccine arm were getting infected more rapidly so they were getting more infection because of the vaccine so they had to terminate so there are huge challenges in vaccine but having said that there are plenty of vaccines under trial there are many other methodologies they are trying prime boost regime adding monoclonal antibodies so on and so forth now we should be indebted to hiv so that we are able to tackle coronavirus the reason why we should be indebted to hiv because all the years of research in hiv has led to a robust vaccine platform for hiv which were not successful un uh, unfortunately but they immediately used it for corona and came out with a vaccine look for antibodies monoclonal antibodies were developed for hiv for post exposure prophylaxis the same technology was used to prepare monoclonal antibodies for covid chimp adenovirus that is a chadox virus that is a covid shield vaccine the vector that is used has been designed for hiv four clinical trials are going with the same vector the chimp adenovirus vaccine is being used for hiv and the same thing was tweaked for covid and it is a successful vaccine for all of us we all have taken dna virus dna has been used a vaccine first in humans in case of hiv the same dna technology is now being used for covid human adenovirus the sputnik vaccine is an adenovirus vaccine that was first tried in hiv but it was not successful but it is very successful in case of covid the adenovirus vaccine in sputnik mrna vaccine i don't have to tell you about it the pfizer and uh, moderna have used the same mrna platform for hiv the same mrna platform was tweaked make a robust vaccine for covid now the first picture that i showed you what is the difference between hiv and sars cov if you see the surface there is no much difference both of them have got a lot of spikes they look the same way round spherical but you do the cross section there is the difference the difference lies in the cross section you have a single stranded positive sense rna in the sars cov you have two strands of positive sand rna in hiv it has got a nucleo capsid it has got reverse transcriptase it has got protease integrase these things are not seen in case of covid so by looking at the surface you'll never know which is a hiv which is a covid but inside the structure totally different and they infect also the same way the hiv takes care of attached to the cd4 antigen gets internalized causes infection and goes into the nucleus forms a pro virus but the covid will attach to the ace receptors in the respiratory epithelium gets internalized and multiplies in the cytoplasm itself it doesn't go into the nucleus that is the only difference and it gets exited out so that is the difference almost similar the the way it comes into the body so the last slide which one is hiv virus looking at the image the green spike proteins are covid and the purple ones are hiv 
it's very difficult to look at the surface and tell you but it's only in the cross section that they come to understand that both are different internally but externally they almost look similar they have spike proteins they enter the same way they are both zoonotic viruses coming jump from animals thank you can you hear me yeah thank you sir for an excellent lecture uh, very informative talk and uh, we uh, got to know the nitty gritties of uh, what should be looked into uh, for uh, patients who are uh, hiv who have hiv and aids and how to diagnose and and uh, the uh, fantastic uh, laboratory uh, tests that you have uh, given us the knowledge about uh so glad but i have a, a few questions for you is that uh, okay to answer right now yeah right so the first question is what is the prognosis of aids patient infected by corona variant or the virus uh that's a very good question because you have two viruses coming in the system at the same time now a uh, aids patient is different from an hiv positive patient an aids patient means he is having aids defining illness he has got a cd4 count less than 200 prognosis is really very poor mm -hmm. for an aids patient is really poor because he already has got uh, opportunistic infections along with this if you have covid the prognosis is very poor he is going to be get ventilated he is going to get admitted and the outcome is bad but if you talk about an hiv positive patient that is totally different you have to differentiate hiv and aids HIV patient is HIV positive, doesn't have a CD4 less than 200, has a CD4 more than 200, and doesn't have AIDS defining illness. So those patients are almost like normal people like you and me. A HIV positive patient who is taking uh, regularly the antiretroviral therapy, keeping his viral load less than 50, which is undetectable, will behave as uh, like a normal human being. He lives a normal life. So HIV positive patient on retroviral therapy with low viral load with high CD4 count will not the outcome would be similar to a normal individual, but an AIDS patient will have a very bad outcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Another question: How vaccination is effective against HIV and Corona? Again, vaccination. All the vaccines for Corona, COVID, which is available, are no. Uh, either killed vaccine subunit vaccine or vector vaccine which is not replication or an mrna vaccine so they will okay. not cause the disease so okay in case of hiv positive patient they should not think twice before taking covid vaccine of hiv positive patient on retroviral therapy good cd4 count low viral load should take the vaccine as recommended to prevent covid covid is more dangerous but an aids patient who is very immunosuppressed it's very unlikely that the vaccine will work because his immune system is down he won't mount an immune response in the first place so very debatable whether a aids patient needs to get a vaccine he needs to come out of aids first get right. a low viral load increase the cd4 count and then take a vaccine to make some sense of it otherwise it won't work in aids patient uh, so last question so there is a patient in australia which uh, we uh, thought of mentioning to you that who took the covid vaccine and has developed hiv infection can you explain the hypothesis for this well i have also another uh, thought on it but first you can say it sir it's a very very interesting question conspiracy theory moving around <laughs> you see how many crore people have got infected with covid and post covid we have come back to a normal uh, my hospital will come back to normal functioning and we are doing uh, at least 150 hiv per day 150 hiv per day for the last one year and we haven't seen a rise in incidence of hiv most of them are post covid patients so don't believe such things except covid infection will not produce hiv antibodies now when come to australia australia developed the vaccine a covid vaccine in the initial days when the covid vaccines were being developed we developed a vaccine which contains the, the protein of hiv virus gp120 okay. and 40 was used okay. to boost the vaccine to increase the potency of the vaccine they used only the proteins of hiv virus and they did a clinical trial they went for human trials for this vaccine and they had to stop the trial in between midway because the pe people who got this vaccine were turning hiv positive they were right. not infected they were developing antibodies to the component of the vaccine that was the okay. viral protein of the hiv 
So that's the reason why they developed HIV antibodies. The trial had to be stopped. The virus, the vaccine itself, it is not going to come into clinical practice. So that all was right. the reason he developed HIV antibodies. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I presume there aren't any more questions. Thank you for an excellent lecture again. And uh, thank you to all the organizers. Uh, over to uh, Dr. Anant Lakshmi. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Revati Deshman for moderating the lecture. That was an informative lecture from Dr. Anil Kumar. Thank you, sir. Definitely, I'm sure the knowledge you shared will help us in our clinical and academic practice. Now, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, I request our HOD and the Secretary of IAOMP. Dr. Nadeem Deti sir, to honor our speaker with a virtual certificate. Thank you, sir. And now I request our principal and the organizing chairman, Dr. Ayn Singh, to honor the moderator with the virtual certificate. Uh, Dr. Revati, uh, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful uh, moderation and uh, managing the scientific session. Kindly accept the certificate uh, from the organizing chair. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you to everybody, IOMP and Thai Mugambiga Dental College and Hospital Chennai and to the respected office bearers. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now it's time for the lecture two and I request Dr. Amuda to introduce the moderator. Over to you, Amuda. Thank you, ma'am. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of second session, Dr. Himani Sukija. Ma'am is a professor and HOD of the Department of Oral Pathology and Oral Microbiology in Index Institute of Dental Sciences. To her credit, ma'am is also the Assistant Registrar of Malwantal University, Indore. I welcome you, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amuta. Uh, I would like to uh, start by thanking Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. A. Einstein, sir, Principal, Thaimu Gambigai uh, Dental College, Chennai, and Organizing Chairman of this webinar. Uh, Professor Dr. Sushmita Saxena, Madam, our beloved and respected President, Madam of IAOMP. Uh, Professor Dr. Nadeem Jadi, sir, Secretary, IAOMP, and Head of Department Oral Pathology, Thaimu Gambigai Dental College, Chennai. Uh, Professor Dr. T. Radhika, Organizing Chair Secretary of this webinar. Uh, Dr. Anant Lakshmi, it was a pleasure coordinating with you. You kept us all in a string together as the scientific convener of this uh, webinar. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Anil Kumar, sir, for a very comprehensive update in your lecture. It was definitely a pleasure listening to you. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker for the day, Dr. R. Ramya Madam, who holds a postgraduate degree in oral pathology and microbiology, and she has 14 years of postgraduate teaching experience. She also has a postgraduate diploma in tobacco control from Anamalai University. She secured a gold medal in her postgraduate program and was selected for the Inspire Scholarship Program for pursuing PhD program by Department of Science and Technology, New Delhi in 2010. She is an expert in the field of salivomics, facilitated the validation of biomarkers in detection of oral squamous cell carcinoma and oral premalignant disorders. She was the co-investigator in the DST TIDE project, which involved development of a no novel a neuroelectrotransmitter management of salivary secretion in xerostomia 
in elderly patient, which has been filed for Indian and international uh, patent. The device bagged, this device bagged two national level awards for its novelty and design. She has worked on a project in quantification of human papilloma virus 16 and 18 in oral pre-malignant lesions and oral cancer. She was part of the team <coughs> conducted a large scale epidemiological study in, at Andaman and Nicobar Islands on the prevalence of oral pre-potentially malignant disorders. She is passionate about phytotherapeutics and is currently working on establishment of in vitro disease models of oral potentially malignant disorders. She currently is also working on a joint project with the National Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology University of Madras on nanoscale flexible hemostat funded by BIRAC, New Delhi. Madam has 65 publications and has co-authored four textbooks. She has one international and five national patents for her medical device innovations. Her significant past credentials include research coordinator of the Institutional Review Board, guest editor of SRM Journal of Dental Research, nodal officer for National Institutional Ranking Framework Committee 2020. Dr. R. Ramya Madam is currently serving as Professor and Head of Oral Biology Department in Savita Dental College, Chennai. She is also the Assistant Dean of the Office of Media Management. She is the Director of Triumph Academy, which serves as a Center for Excellence in Dentistry. And to bring to your um, kind attention, it is a complete pleasure for me to introduce her today because I coincidentally happened to be her junior uh, during our post-graduation studies and when I got to know that I will be moderating for her session as a speaker I could not hide my excitement at all. It is such a surprisingly coincident uh, coincidence that has happened and I really thank the you know the conference um, organizers. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Ramya, madam, uh, the screen is all yours. I'm sorry, I can't say the stage is all yours. So the screen is completely yours, ma'am. Thank you, Imani. And uh, I'm so humbled by your wonderful and very, very sweet words. And uh, I would really sincerely thank uh, Nadim sir for having chosen me to provide in such a prestigious platform today. It, I'm really honored, sir, uh, because this is my first presentation in front of the pathology experts. I'm really excited to be here in front of you all. And uh, I'm really grateful for uh, all the organizers to having chosen me to be with you all today. Uh, thank you. And I think I can start sharing the screen. If you can kindly confirm if this Screen is visible. Yeah. Yes, madam, yeah. it is visible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Full screen now. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I'm Dr. Ramya, and I'm here to present the HIV-mediated oral dysbiosis with you all today. And uh, we have just passed the oral uh, men the HIV uh, day yesterday, and it was uh, a very important thing that we all need to be familiarized with this HIV again, because we have really moved and all of us, every one of us know what viruses mean. And we have been really threatened by the viruses. And even when uh, HIV was really threatening as a pandemic, never was it so, uh, what I say, frightful as it is now. So if it was the same presentation two years before, the reception that it would receive would have been different. And now we are in a different era totally and, and it all makes a difference. And again, here I tell you that we all know what is a pandemic now. We have been reeling under a pandemic and we have new variants coming up. So this is a time where I would say that we have actually, these two years have really made us forget the severity of what HIV used to be. HIV used to be uh, talked about very, very seriously in the earlier times. But now I feel we have really 
uh, cut down and then moved on because the times have changed and there are newer players now. And uh, what we need to remember and recollect here, uh, my earlier speaker, Anil Sir, had already enlightened us with all the facts, but a quick look at the facts. We should know that this is a very, very large global public health issue. And most importantly, there is still no cure. And as we were, I was mentioning about the other uh, pandemic, which is we are reeling now, there is no vaccine for AIDS till now. We have been uh, handling so many vaccines and you've been hearing about how the vaccines were developed in just the previous lecture, but here we don't have any vaccine for AIDS till now. So how are we managing it? It's all, all being only symptomatic management and symptomatic management again makes it uh, more challenging because there's still a lot more to be done in this particular area of uh, the disease uh, states. And this is just to tell you about how widespread the disease is. Not a single area is left out and the entire globe is affected. And that is why it is a very persistent pandemic. And the moment you hear a oral pathologist or any dentist talking about HIV, we always keep looking about uh, hearing HIV related oral uh, manifestations and uh, things so on. So all of us actually are very well aware about HIV related oral manifestations. So that is why I purposefully uh, had to highlight a few areas into the initial onsets of how the pathogenesis would really happen. So HIV and oral health will not be complete if we don't touch upon the most important uh, highlights. We know that these patients are at definitely a high risk of having oral infections. And as dentists, we have to be extra careful because we are the guardians of the entry and entry point of this beautiful machine, the human body. And again, why HIV mediated oral dysbiosis? Because as already said, I really wanted to highlight on the initiating factors and how it is relevant to us. And it is because these mucosal pathogenesis is what we need to put more thrust upon. And it is that particular part of the area where there is a huge scope which lies in terms of derivation of therapeutic strategies later. So right now, our uh, approaches have been slightly different. So just to uh, make a thrust upon this particular area, that is why the topic was specifically titled as HIV-mediated oral dysbiosis. So why is this particular topic? So whatever, whether whichever entry point the HIV virus managed to enter the body, whichever uh, entry point was that, there was always a mucosa. And always do remember any body openings will always be covered with the mucosa because mucosa provides that defense mechanisms. So again, to stress upon that important point, the mucosal barrier is what is going to be highlighted here. So mucosal surfaces account for vast majority of HIV transmission and rarely, definitely we have the hematological route as well. And then we have the fecal maternal transmission all that, but the most important or the vast majority of transmission route is definitely the mucosal surfaces. And these are the surfaces which play a very, very crucial role in HIV acquisition and the spread across and going into the deeper areas. So having known that this is the most important or the most common area of interest, the next thing is what is mucosa immediately surrounded with, as already said, all the body openings are actually covered by the mucosa and wherever we have the body exposed to the external environment, we have the microbiome, the world of microbiome present over there. So starting from our upper part, upper regions of the body, that is your nasal and the eye and your oral cavity, all actually lead down to, again, the exit openings. And the entire area, we have the GI tract opening from the mouth and then exiting through the anus everywhere. There is a microbiome which, which actually extends from the top to the bottom. To understand this is very, very important. And now we have been hearing a lot about the gut microbiome. And the, there is uh, this is, again, what I wanted to specify today. The mucosa and the microbiome together have to be given a lot of thrust in deriving a lot of newer research concepts and newer therapeutic opportunities. So the moment you hear microbiome, microbiome, the core microbiome is actually the, um, what I say, the major parts, which is always there in any 
healthy individual with a very balanced immune status and then it starts varying with various changes in terms of lifestyle changes and there are numerous factors which actually bring about changes in that core microbiome so having had that even the smallest uh, different kind of food for example you have been brought up in a very native community and you have uh, have a chance of uh, having a uh, food which is which doesn't belong to your community that is enough to change the microbiome because your body was brought, born in a particular uh, geographical location and it is de uh, designed in such a way that the microbiome community is actually uh, designed in a different way so that is when all these alterations come up and we have been witnessing the huge changes in microbiome and there is a lot of studies related to chronic illnesses related to this microbiome it is all because of altered food practices which has been really on rise after almost say 70 uh, years now especially after the uh, freedom in india earlier it was mostly related to uh, ancient foods uh, why am i talking like a dietitian here that is because please do understand we as guardians of the entry portal have to be very much aware of this uh, very important factor called diet the most important factor called the microbiome and the mucosal barrier. All these three things are very, very critical in managing and balancing your beautiful machine, which the nature has bestowed upon you. So this human microbiome has to be kept in a proper balance. And if there is an alteration in this particular balance, that is when the trouble comes. So to before that, to just have a quick look at oral microbiome, we know that the oral microbiome is consisting of a huge uh, group of uh, taxa of microbes, not only related to bacteria, there is fungi, there is viruses, which are there always. And now going into the key terminology for today. So our topic for today, HIV mediated oral dysbiosis means that there is an alteration, the dis alteration in the biome. That is your alteration in the microbiome is what actually is exactly contributing to the pathogenesis. It might sound simple, but I'm just trying to re-emphasize this particular terminology bringing into the pathogenesis is because for you to understand and correlate and think of better treatment outcomes and think of better uh, therapeutic outcomes. So having told that particular word over here, it is very simple to understand this biosis means alteration in the normal biome or the microbiome. So we have a beautiful spectra over here. The first one says symbiosis, where everything exists in harmony, in balance, and that becomes disrupt, disrupted. It can just be a simple alteration in diet. It can just be a simple change in your habitary practices. Just um, anyone, just go smoke, and then your microbiome becomes altered. Anything, any small thing which actually goes into this beautiful system if there is an alteration, then there will be a dysbiotic state. So disruption then becomes persistent to form the dysbiotic environment. So this dysbiotic environment gives rise to various chronic diseases, specifically chronic inflammatory diseases. So that is what has to be remembered when we know uh, when we are talking about this dysbiosis. So once the dysbiosis is established, there is a stable disease microbial community that actually gets sets up in the body so this is very important for you to understand why again this particular point is being stressed out is there was symbiosis and then what there was disruption and then it became dysbiosis so the dysbiotic microbiome means there is an altered microbiome can we really shift that microbiome back to the symbiotic microbiome it takes a lot of effort and most of the studies till date have reported negative on that particular aspect. So how do we go about? There is a lot of uh, approaches on that particular area, but please do remember that once the disease or the disease microbiome establishes itself, the alterations in the mucosa becomes unaltered or irreversible. This may not be clinically uh, manifested, but there will be always a pro-inflammatory environment which is there persistently present in the mucosal environment. Because of such a status, you have different kinds of diseases uh, being formed. Simple examples, 
other than uh, related to HIV, the chronic diseases are your Crohn's disease. Of course, we don't hear that much now, but all of you at least would have heard about something called as inflammatory bowel disease. IBD has become a fashion statement now. It's so saddening to hear that every member in a family or at least in the close family would definitely have IBDs. So IBD typically comes because of dysbiosis of the uh, gastrointestinal mucosa. And please do remember, we are there at the forefront. So it is very, very important. And why does this dysbiosis happen? It can be because of an infection. And that is where we are now. So infective agent coming into the symbiotic environment and then disrupting the entire environment, bringing into change. And the moment infection sets in, there is always inflammation in the mucosa. And it can also be because of diet. It can also be because of xenobiotics. We all know that antibiotics have really uh, done a lot of harm than goodness. Um, there might be people who disagree with me on this concept. I'm a very strong, um, uh, uh, I want to say, I uh, really uh, strongly uh, support uh, natural kind of living and uh, uh, holistic kind of living. And uh, then we also have genetic factors playing in familial transmission coming up. There are other very interesting factors over here are your circadian disruption. The moment we hear circadian disruption, oh yeah, I don't have time to sleep. I don't get enough time to sleep. There's too much of work, bad this, or you sleep, you don't get sleep and things like that. So if your sleep patterns are altered, then you have your circadian disruption coming up and then maternal high fat diet during pregnancy and uh, the pregnant mothers, there is a huge responsibility over them and then physical injury and so on. So all that are actually causing this biosis. So now this is what is most important. So having told so much about dysbiosis, the origin and uh, other disease states again, why is this given a lot of stress nowadays, dysbiosis? The moment you um, chart out that dysbiotic uh, pattern in your body, in, such, in a patient's body with such a particular disease, then you can design a therapy accordingly. There have been many, many interesting therapeutic approaches it might um, make a, I mean, you might be surprised hearing about fecal microbiota transplantation happening very much because uh, that might be a bit uh, kind of uh, put you in surprise, but they have proved that dysbiosis can really be reversed by fecal uh, microbiota transplantation where a fecal content from a healthy donor is placed on a diseased donor and they have found out really good evidences about it. So microbiome engineering again has made a wonderful effect and you can see probiotics, probiotics, of course, we Indians know the use of probiotics in our diet right from very, very early primitive uh, stages. So nothing to about, uh, boast about that, but again, probiotics, it just not enough. You will have to supply pro probiotics very, very profusely so that there is at least some alteration in the dysbiosis, which actually sets up. Now coming to the mucosa, why are we so much uh, trusting about the mucosa? Mucosa is again the entry point at which or the most common entry point of the HIV virus where it gets attached and then uh, breaks the continuum or it enters through an already traumatized mucosa, whatever. The major critical life cycle of the virus happens at this particular site. That is your inductive and the effector phases of the viral infective response happens at this particular site and immediately below the mucosa throughout, right from the top to the bottom, we have something called as malt associated lymphoid tissues. Every location has a different, different terminology, but in common, it is MALT, which are actually standing like a band of defense persons taking care of your uh, body cavities and the entire tract through which your food goes in. So that is why food is often referred to as food is medicine. If you're able to have a very high food discipline, there is any rare chance that you might have a disease state. And again, coming back to this malt associated uh, disease. So what happens is when there is a uh, infective agent or any kind of trauma, what happens is this malt associated lymphoid tissues gets activated and there is a pro-inflammatory cascade which is happening and the first thing which gets secreted is your IgA secreting plasma cells. We all know IgA is very, very common and very familiar to us because salivary uh, immunoglobulin, the most common immunoglobulin in the saliva is IgA. So having heard that, that comes into, into uh, play. 
And then what else happens? Now, coming into the proper HIV-mediated oral dysbiosis, the one-line statement about HIV infection, we know that there is an alteration in the CD4, CD8 T cells. Okay, so in that CD4, CD8 T cell ratio alteration, the more massive reduction happens in the CD4 T cells. When there is a massive reduction like that, what happens is body is not able to defend itself against the entry coming from outside. So when this event is happening, there is a chance that there is an immune deficiency which is happening because of the viral entry. Usually the virus comes and then there is an immune surge. But this virus itself keeps damaging the immune system itself. And having said that, how common is the entry point or the mucosal entry? How common is it, especially in adults? It is more common in the other um, uh, openings at the lower part of the body than in the upper part, that is your oral cavity. But pediatric uh, transmissions are very, very high in, in case of oral uh, risk, especially the oral mucosa. And in that such a cases, you have the mucosal surface playing a very, very crucial role. And the most important thing is the moment it infects, it depletes. It depletes the... Uh, T cells, and not only that, it damages the mucosal barrier. How does that happen? So it comes, it enters, it invades, and damages the surrounding environment. How does that happen? So because of that damage, there is increased permeability of the mucosal barrier. So the mediating uh, events which happen for breakage of this immune mediated or the immune breakage of barrier is because of a huge surge of inflammatory mediators which come into play and we have an array of events which are happening. So the first one which was already said was first the CD4 going down and then we have the T helper cells immediately coming into play. So those T helper cells come into play and then they are given to a lot of cell mediated type of infection and this cell mediated infection, I mean, uh, inflammation provides a lot of cytokine mediated reactions. So those cytokines, the release actually damages the intestinal or increases the intestinal permeability and that leads to further microbial translocation. So what was there outside the mucosa is entering inside because of loss of mucosal barrier and then it goes into the lamina propria and then enters the blood vessel and then takes up a systemic spread. So microbial translocation is what actually is very, very important and it has been very clearly pointed out to depletion of lymphocytes capable of producing your cytokines, especially your interleukin-17 and interleukin-22. It's just not these two. The most important is being highlighted so that you carry some very important points from this lecture. And the other important challenge over here, like how we keep hearing for the past two years, all of us have had vaccines or most of us have had vaccines and we know how the outcomes were. They were protective or they were not protective. There have been multiple um, variations in the outcome results. The same happens for HIV mode of treatment where there is no vaccine, there is only symptomatic management. What happens is the moment we expect a medication regime being taken, we expect there to be a definite improvement in the outcome of the disease. But what really happens is it doesn't happen that way. And there is not much change in the mucosa and the microbiome even after uh, antiretroviral therapy. So that is what is the le recent literature updates which have really highlighted upon this particular dysbiosis related to HIV. So there is no uh, changes as far as the dysbiotic microbiome and there is no change in the mucosal barrier. The permeability is still there. Your ART is only doing a very, very superficial symptomatic management. So having said that, why are we hearing all these aspects? Because as pathologists, we are actually, we can think about strategies which are related to the mucosa and which are related to the saliva. And I'm not telling you to derive some new formulations, but you are the ones who can actually tell what is the problem at the foundational level. What is the problem at the ground level? And that is what actually makes anybody else derive ideas from there. And then they might be able to give you a better formulation. And HIV infection and mucosal immunity, again, the other important factors which are very, very importantly playing a deterministic role are your pathogen recognition uh, receptors, your PRRs, 
and there are a lot of other metabolic sensors that acts as suppressors and activators. So we have your cytokines, the lymphokines, your uh, cell-mediated immunity, TH17, and so on. So additionally, we have your pattern recognition receptors, which are uh, really researched a lot nowadays. And the, there is a huge shift to metabolome nowadays. Earlier, it was uh, more of a genome, proteome, and now it has become metabolome because the world has understood how important that just that metabolic uh, events contribute in disease process. So here we have metabolic sensors which are actually damaged with HIV infection as well. So you can see the scope in multiple areas as how all these can be targeted and how all these can be used. So these immunological changes which are actually happening definitely cause a almost irreversible damage which leads to further hyperactivation. So this is a very important uh, statement. We know how common periodontitis is. So periodontitis is the next most prevalent disease in the human community. The first most common is dental caries and followed by periodontitis. The moment we hear such a statement, what does it imply in HIV infection? The more prevalent a uh, disease is, and you are already having talking about a disease which is going to completely cut off the immune uh, status or the immune defense mechanisms. So there is already a mild periodontitis in a patient and he gets in, infected with HIV. What happens is both these situations join and there is a synergistic effect because of these two events. And what happens or what um, happens as an outcome becomes a hyperimmune activation. So that is why you have exaggerated periodontal problems in HIV patients. So this happens because of hyperimmune activation. So that is where we as oral pathologists need to give a lot of trust to. So I was actually talking to you about the microbiome, the mucosa. And in addition, we also have to be very, very clearly remembering that there are often persistent infectory uh, sites inside the oral cavity, potential uh, foci, which are actually ready to get more triggered or more flared up, making the disease more uh, serious. So this is again very important. This is a very simple, very simple schematic diagram telling about the path of the virus. This says how it just is there on the surface. And this is the time when you have the zero to two days, we can actually try playing with the saliva uh, intervention over here and try doing a salivary intervention by maybe by uh, targeting some kind of uh, anti-immune drugs or immune, increasing the immunoglobulins. There is a, again a huge scope over there that is from zero to two, and then from zero to uh, I mean zero to two days, and after two, two to four days, then it once it enters the again, we have we can, the, we can actually decide on manipulating the MALT group of uh, infective mechanisms or the lympho lymphoid mechanisms. So that is how it has to work up. So we have two areas of target, one on the superior and one on the immediate inferior portion of the mucosal barrier, where there can be multiple uh, targets which actually can be designed and thought of, thought of. So again, the moment we say HIV-related oral transmission, it's been a matter of debate mainly because we always been uh, told that the mode of entry is not very commonly in the oral route, but we all know that the practices have been altered over the past two, three decades and altered uh, sexual practices have increasingly uh, led to oral transmission or mucosal transmission. But nowadays it's become more lesser and a very surprising uh, link between COVID and HIV. There has been a significantly lower reports in HIV occurrence because of social distancing norms. Again, uh, on a serious note, let us go into this orogenital transmission and oro uh, oral transmission, there is always a debate, but whatever, if it happens through the oral cavity, how are we going to address it? And always do remember, oral pathologists, we need not have to be always restricted to this area. All we need that this is actually the enlarging spectrum of the entire body. And if you can actually uh, find out a newer uh, pathogenetic concept with all these said mechanisms, we can actually extrapolate it to the entire GI tract and the other mucosal tracts as well. So this breakage is in the mucosa is very, very important. And uh, there is a new uh, method, which I mean, new terminology with 
actually keep saying that people living with HIV, so this number of people living with HIV has really increased over the decades because of very, very high advances in ARTs, that is your antiretroviral therapies. There has been really big advances, but again, there are only advances and maybe the symptoms are maybe treated better, but still it is only symptomatic management. But the lifespan of the individual has definitely improved. But again, we know that there are other challenges happening, other viral infections coming up, other bacterial infections coming up, still the damaged infection, infective person is always more uh, vulnerable. So again, we have other important features over here. So to understand this in detail, as I already said, the saliva has a very important role and that can be really uh, managed. And to, this is again a very important schematic diagram. As I already said, we have the T helper cell. The most important one among these is the TH17 and the other interleukins. There, is, there are a big cascade of interleukins. The most common ones are the IL-4 and IL-17. So once all this happens, then there is the blood vessel lying over here and that leads to microbial translocation. And uh, here at, at this particular point, we have the IgA playing a big role in uh, defense mechanisms. So what really happens in such a dysbiotic environment? There is an impairment in the local immunity and that leads to decrease in IgA, defensins and cytokines. So as the uh, disease becomes more prolonged, or as the disease becomes established, then the, the impairment is uh, spread to other areas as well. Now, uh, this is a point where we need to approach this on a bottom-up approach also. So far, we were actually talking about top-down approach. From a bottom-up approach, what if it has entered through other sites of entry and what if it has come to the oral cavity? or it has spread in a systemic spread. So if it is undergone a systemic spread, again, a mucosal, uh, the entire mucosal uh, layers would be damaged and they, it, not, it doesn't just uh, stops with that, it affects the salivary glands. And we all know that salivary glands have actually a, a very uh, phylic tendency with viral uh, proteins and they have the ability to colonize viral proteins. So all these actually, uh, lead to a vicious cycle and that leads to more uh, damage. So here we have a study which says that HIV infected individuals, regardless whether they are having um, your antiretroviral therapy or not, the number of bacteria, the load is almost the uh, same or even higher. So that is how it is and there is no big changes and the mucosal immunity or the mucosal damage is what is very, very important. So the role of oral microbiota in HIV infected individuals is very, very important. And this is very important to uh, tell you what dysbiosis we said. Dysbiosis is alteration of the biome. Anything specific? Yes, there is anything. There are specific uh, bacteria which has been reported. Vialonella, Prevotella, Megaspira and Campylobacter. Have we not heard them in periodontitis? Yes, they are more common in periodontitis. And please do understand that periodontitis is one of the most common uh, prevalent disease, but there are many, many other prevalent species in HIV associated uh, infections. So whatever was said so far is just to give you an overview that the mucosa, the microbiome alteration, if we can disrupt and change the microbiome balance, that would be great. And if you can actually target the malt group of lymphoid tissue, that would be great. But if it doesn't happen, what else? if the virus is already entered and what does the oral cavity have with this? Again, before going into the oral manifestations, again, not in detail, a very quick look at the oral manifestations. I thought as pathologists, all of you would be interested to know the histopathological changes in HIV affected tissue. I'm not talking anything about specific lesions in HIV associated uh, individuals, just the mucosa. How does it change when there is a viral entry and there is a viral replication? This is what we need to know as pathologists, very, very important. So under microscope, how does the micro, I mean, under the light microscope, how does the viral change look like? So the most common viral change which can happen is your hyperplasia. Again, it, the hyperplasia is not because of basilar hyperplasia. I mean, the basal regions alone, not just increase in size. It is almost similar to an inflammatory hyperplasia and a viral infected hyperplasia. It is not that, but the increase in numbers is not only correlating with your basilar hyperplasia, it is because of 
increase in cell diameter and increase migration of more of inflammatory cells inter and intracellular edema which is actually cause this enlargement of the epithelium additionally we also have glycogenic acanthosis at this particular point please do remember i mentioned the metabolic sensors in hiv also make a very important role so please do recollect the important point which we were talking about the cytokines lymphokines and additionally we we said about the cell mediated uh, molecules and we also have the metabolic sensors so where are we coming down so there are changes in the cell metabolic uh, metabolome and that is what is actually manifested as a glycogenic acanthosis at the light microscopic level imagine if it was showing at the light microscopic level what all should be there at a a uh, sub micron level there should be definitely many many more and what all should be at a genomic level so if we can find out this if our mind knows that what we see though this might sound basic but if we can actually keep looking into every small pieces of a tissue which is just thrown into routine um uh, routine uh, what to say gingiva uh, and things like that you can keep advising uh, all your surgeons and periodontists especially to give not to throw the tissues and then send it for you to routine biopsy especially if you are in an academic institute those small uh, tissue specimen can this be routinely screened and especially if there that particular patient was a positive patient and he is at to establish a proper oral manifestation still you can actually get in to see all this and what can you do from a pathologist perspective tell the surgeon or tell the oral medicine specialist or tell the periodontist that the changes are already there they are to manifest clinically so what we have seen is we actually have a, a third eye to see inside deeper so that's a speciality of pathologists over there so with that third eye we can see all these beautiful changes over there so glycogenic acanthosis cell burning spongiosis and all these might actually uh, tell you that these might be common with many other disease but if you correlate it with a proper uh, history then i think you can actually find out these really very well the next thing is the most important thing we come into the typical part of any hiv related uh, dental lectures hiv associated oral disease so this hiv associated oral disease this particular chart though it appears very clumsy over there i had to put this because this gives you an entire um, a framework of what to expect with an hiv infection so lesions which are strongly associated with hiv infection is what we need to understand so we can quickly see that it's candidiasis hairy leukoplakia kaposi sarcoma and periodontal disease in addition we have non hodgkin's lymphoma the other uh, lesions are all coexistent and comorbidities which can keep uh, coming up and down depending on the immune status of the individual and then further we have periodontal disease the first one the most common one the all of you would be knowing here is the most important thing you have necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis that is hiv related necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis linear gingival erythema and then we have periodontitis as well so these are the typical uh, features expected from a periodontal disease associated with hiv but how common are they that's the most important thing so how common are they and how prevalent are they so they are actually less prevalent than expected remember i told you periodontitis or periodontal diseases are most common one of the most common oral disease but in hiv patient considering the other diseases or the other oral manifestation the periodontal diseases only account to 9 to 3.6% so candidiasis again is the most important or most prevalent uh, I think uh, there is some technical issue. Uh, 
can i be heard uh, okay. ma'am we can hear you ma'am yeah, we can uh, hear we are sorry for the technical glitch we'll get no, back to you not, not a problem i think i'll just try to get in touch with dr ramya madam and find out whether she's still there please give yeah, me sure ma'am Uh, Ramya Madam is back with us. Yeah, I'm sorry for that delay. There was a a small interruption in the net connectivity. I'm sorry for that. So, uh, candidiasis is what we need to look, and we know that uh, candidiasis presents with a multiple of spectra of lesions. So that has to be uh, kept in mind, and this is the most prevalent uh, disease. And the next what is expected is your oral warts. The moment you see a polyp like growth over here, you can understand that. the hpv plays a role and this hpv is very commonly expected to increase in numbers when there is a immune deficiency state in the body so otherwise hpv may there are many types of hpv we know that there is a big list of hpv is present and the genotypes multiple uh, genotypes are there but only few actually uh, cause disease but what happens is there is an alteration in the Uh, hpv dna especially the oncogenic types take a upper hand with hiv related uh, disease and then further we also have kaposi sarcoma which again is a very uh, proliferative vascular disorder which has a purplish uh, violaceous hue over there on the palate which is again a very common thing and this again happens to about most common neoplasm in hiv related lesion and next common is your oral hairy leukoplakia where you can see that there is a prominent leukoplakia like incidence and this is very common not only in hiv related there are other immune deficiency states where we see uh, oral hairy leukoplakia at this particular juncture quickly recollect that the most common oral manifestations are your candidiasis and then we have your warts then we have your oral hairy leukoplakia and kaposi sarcoma and to summarize today's uh, lecture on oral mediated uh, dysbiosis the most important thing is oral epithelial cells have the capability to maintain microbial colonization and when there is a disrupted autal immunity that is when your hiv actually uh, tries to create it tries to disrupt the mechanism and if when it tries to disrupt the mechanism during that stage itself if you can intervene and if you can create a difference it makes a big uh, change and once it gets established then we have a lot of other things coming up at this particular thing please do remember the hyper immune activation state which can happen just because of poor oral hygiene already the body has a huge infective load of the immune deficiency virus additionally if the oral hygiene is also poor then both of them add together to form a hyper uh, immune status and then the severity becomes more uh, more uh, higher or more uh, stronger and uh, with these uh, few uh, things i would like to conclude and again to thrust on the future perspectives mucosal immunity understanding and intervening would really give you lot of very very beneficial diagnostic therapeutic and prophylactic uh, solutions and with all these we can actually make a very big difference so then the most important other markers like your activation markers of your inflammatory system your pattern regulation receptors all your cytokines and chemokines host defense peptides as already mentioned the metabolic biosensors all of them are actually waiting to be uh, assessed examined and then used for creating a more Uh, better specific diagnostic therapeutic and prophylactic strategies in hiv so uh, whenever there is a bigger uh, issue coming up we tend to forget what is happening on a daily basis so not to forget about all these severe diseases we know that covid is going to stay here for some more time 
but these are the diseases which has been there with us on a very very strong uh, foothold for almost now three decades now so as a pathologist we have that uh, responsibility to think of making a big difference in our fellow beings life and that is why we have been this time to be a healthcare worker and additionally as a healthcare worker we are destined to be pathologists who can break down the barriers who can actually dig upon the foundation tell new and identify new solutions so as an individual you may not be able to make a big difference but you can definitely create a small ripple and that would make all the difference i would sincerely thank uh, my mentors here in the institution for giving me such a wonderful uh, stage to perform and my heartfelt thanks to uh, the principal sir of um, Taimogambike Dental College i'm proud to see a oral pathologist at the helm of affairs at the institution and all the uh, stalwarts of the indian association of oral and maxillofacial pathology association uh, watching me here and nadim sir again and my Uh, favorite junior radhika here and ananta lakshmi and above all uh, imani it was really great to have been as uh, seeing you as a moderator in my session that was a pure coincidence and we really enjoyed both of us enjoyed doing here thank you again thank you for your patience listening and i'm ready to take your questions thank you uh, may i uh, may i get go uh, can i get going with the questions please yeah Do i have permission to start yeah thank you uh dr ramya madam there is a question from the audience uh, which says uh, what are the effects of uh, heart h a a r t uh, on the oral microorganisms okay so uh, these actually are more specific uh, regimes actually your uh, treatment regimes and these regimes uh, that is why i just specifically told a r t alone all the kind of uh, regimes related to anti retroviral therapy have been proven to not cause any big change in the microbiome that is my first statement and because of that all that you can actually derive from any kind of regimen which is allowed which is present right now is that they would reduce the severity of the disease but they are not able to alter the uh, microbial population or they are not able to alter the microbial or sorry the mucosal permeability or the damage uh there is another i hope uh, the audience is uh, you know satisfied with that question uh, with their uh, with the answer to that question uh there is another question here uh like uh, the probiotics for the gut like the probiotics for the gut i repeat is there any supplement available to replenish the oral commensals that are uh, lost due to the dysbiosis yeah that would be a really interesting research question i really uh, enjoyed hearing that question uh, can you name the participant who took that no i was i do not have the name of the participant okay. though okay. whoever not it is and whoever dr sai lakshmi amara mia dr sai lakshmi okay. oh, uh, from sir which college my department oh <laughs> great so you have a very nice um product getting ready there which you can actually translate <laughs> so okay. actually uh, sai lakshmi that was really great listening to that question itself because that is what i was repeatedly mentioning uh, please do understand uh, there is i don't think i or i may not be aware as far as my little knowledge is um, aware i am not sure if there is any oral uh, probiotics available but what i have seen is i have seen multiple attempts where there have been um, people developing trying to develop on probiotic use on this and this like that uh, i don't think there is any oral specific probiotic as far as i know so you can actually check and uh, if it is not there please try to work on it and please do understand it is not very difficult it is just that thought process which small clicks and then you can make it really big very very happy to hear that uh there is another question here uh can you highlight uh, can you give a little insight uh, about uh, inflammaging that attributes to the pro inflammatory environment okay so inflammaging i was actually very tempted to add that and i'm happy to see that question over here so the word inflammasome we know what inflammasome means inflammasome is something like your microbiome where a group of inflammatory activities the mediators 
all play a role. So inflammasome uh, pattern is different for every different disease. So similarly, we have a concept here in HIV mediated mucosal lesions that's called as inflammaging. Inflam, inflame aging. So split it as aging. And that means actually what happens is, as I already said, there is something called hyperactivation of the immune system in the presence of your oral, uh, poor oral hygiene, especially with periodontitis. The moment you have hyperactivation, what happens is there is a pro-inflammatory environment, which is persistent always. So that actually leads to a consistent uh, mucosal damage leading to a irreversible damage, which is very difficult to get it back. So when such an event is happening, there is accelerated aging of the mucosal tissue is what actually inflammation aging suggests. And I think we have one last question here, which seems to be very interesting to me at least. Uh, what is the impact of COVID on HIV healthcare policies in your opinion? Okay. Uh, that again, I just wanted to touch upon this in the beginning, but I didn't want to drag it further and deviate from the topic. And I think all of you would have definitely uh, thought of the moment uh, Nadim so called up and said, there's a workshop on HIV. I was like, oh, wow, it's nice to remember the disease again, because we have really forgotten that there was a, a disease very much with us, because as dentists, we need to be constantly reminded of this particular virus, because this virus, again, at least for COVID, we have some kind of uh, vaccines or some kind of uh, therapeutic uh, modalities. But uh, we know HIV, the moment uh, the previous speaker was very clearly saying, it's almost like ringing the death bell to him. The moment you give a, a report saying that he's HIV positive. So till, till date, it is so, uh, what to say, lethal to hear. But what happens is these two years, we have completely or comfortably forgotten about it and all the government missionary has slowly shifted towards um, handling HIV, sorry, handling COVID related uh, damages. We can't uh, find fault with such a thought process, but always there should be thrust in such consistent chronic diseases as well to uh, save the mankind from such serious illnesses. Uh, I think we do not have any further questions. So with that, uh... May I thank Dr. R. Ramya, madam, for the very uh, simply put presentation because I've heard her from, I've been hearing her for the last more than 15 years, if I remember, right from seminars to journal clubs to our nervousness to this platform here, this uh, very uh, esteemed platform, I must say. The institution itself is uh, such a, a wonderful institution and to top it all, IOMP, back it up. It's absolutely great. So thank you, Ramya, madam, for putting uh, such complicated facts so simply as always that you've always been doing. And thank you again, IAOMP and all the um, uh, office holders who have helped everyone enjoy this webinar today. Thank you uh, to the uh, senior doctors and organizing uh, team of Thaimogam Vigai Dental College, Chennai. Uh, I would like to hand it over to organizing team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Himani, for moderating the session. That was, a, that was an educative and mind-boggling lecture. Thank you, Dr. Ramya, for enlightening us with the current concepts and facts in HIV and AIDS pertaining to dentistry and oral pathology. Now, I request Dr. Nadim Jedi, IAOMP Secretary, to honor the speaker with the E certificate. Uh, very well presented uh, uh, webinar, uh, Ramya. Thank you so much for accepting our offer. Uh, I think uh, the students and the staffs are really benefited by this. Thank you very much for again being here with us. Thank you, sir. It's a privilege. Thank you. And I request Dr. Radhika, the organizing secretary, to honor the moderator with the virtual certificate. Uh, thank you, Dr. Himani Sutija, ma'am, uh, for your uh, contribution and for your flawless uh, moderation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you. God bless you. 
thank you ma'am so all good things come to an end and it's time to conclude the scientific session of topaz 2021 and also i request dr radhika to give the vote of thanks uh, a very good afternoon one and all uh, as the executive committee member of iaoop and also the organizing secretary of today's event uh, it gives me immense pleasure in delivering the vote of thanks at the outset i express my sincere gratitude to our management our honorable chairman thiru ac shanmugam sir our dynamic president engineer acs arun kumar sir and our beloved secretary thiru a ravi kumar sir for always being a great source of support and strength i would like to place on record our sincere gratitude to our vice chancellor dr s geeta lakshmi ma'am provost dr gopalakrishnan sir rector dr vishwanathan sir and registrar dr palnivel sir for their constant encouragement in whatever we do uh, my heartfelt thanks to the office bearers of iomp for providing us this wonderful opportunity of collaborating with our association i extend my sincere thanks to our organizing chairman and principal dr einstein sir and the joint registrar come head of the department dr nadim jedi sir for providing us this opportunity and for always supporting and encouraging us and yes i thank our eminent speakers of today's event professor dr anil kumar sir and professor dr ramya ma'am for their enriching academic sessions and yes ma'am you are my favorite senior too and i'm really happy to watch you here because uh, i am ma'am's junior in my undergraduate thank you ma'am and i also thank dr revathi deshmukh ma'am and dr himani sukija ma'am for their flawless moderation and uh, my special thanks to all the delegates Uh, head of the institutions head of the departments uh, my fellow oral pathologists undergraduate and postgraduate students and dentists from all across the country for having registered in huge numbers and for making this event a grand success indeed we are overwhelmed by the milestone response received over 1000 registrations for today's event thank you all once again i thank the magic association of our university for the technical support rendered and last but not the least i thank my fellow colleagues of my organizing team uh, our scientific convener dr anantha lakshmi dr sai lakshmi and dr ramuda for your excellent cooperation and team work thank you all once again and uh, for the kind uh, attention of delegates uh, you will be receiving your participation certificates via email uh, due to the high number of registrations kindly give us a week time it will be reaching you all so thank you and uh, once again until we meet uh, in another similar academic forum it's uh, bye and thank you from team oral pathology sai mugambike dental college and hospital thank you